Ah, here it is. Back at 215. Again, just to uh, reiterate, back at, it's a little different from uh, the other um, minor prophets in that Habakkuk is questioning why it is that God would use such an evil uh, nation as the Chaldeans to punish uh, people of Judah of whom some were, in fact, righteous. And so he, he starts out with, or well, if you can call it an accusation, a problem, whatever, uh, he starts that out. And then God answers him. So we'll get into that, but first let's have a uh, short prayer. Father, we ask thy blessing upon us as we study thy word. We pray, Father, that we may be impressed with with the fact that all the things that you have done, whether it's punishment or prosperity, bane or blessing, that you have done for our salvation. May we learn the lessons of old, that we do not repeat them in the here and now. Keep us in thy care, and we thank thee for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. In this uh, particular section, uh, chapter 2, uh, beginning 6 on down. This is God answering. He's replying to Habakkuk, and he's expressing woes to uh, the things that the people do, you know, like uh, woe to those who uh, convert uh, evil gain for the house. Woe, woe to those who, in essence, use slave labor to build their uh, abode and, and cities and what have you. Down in verse 15, it says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle even to make him drink, that you may look upon his nakedness. Now, this may not actually mean that whoever he's talking about is giving uh, alcoholic beverage to whoever it is he's addressing. But it is true, what he says is true though. Uh, if, if you give intoxicating, intoxicating beverage to a neighbor and, and uh, to get him drunk, that, that's a bad thing. But he uses that uh, as a simile to those, to the Chaldeans that uh, they, they would conquer these nations. He makes all sorts of promises to them as to riches and prosperity, this, that, and the other, that they become sated on the uh, prospect of riches and power and what have you, and then the uh, uh, Chaldeans don't deliver, and they just, in essence, strip them of all their material wealth. That's why they say, uh, look upon his nakedness. Nakedness is not necessarily uh, stripped of clothing. It may mean they have no possessions anymore. All their possessions have been taken, so they they are in effect uh, naked, stripped of possessions. You will, you you are filled in verse sixteen. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink now. Again, it doesn't mean that you know you you drink intoxicating beverage, but what you try to do to these people you conquered. The same thing is going to happen to you. You're going to be stripped of your possession. That you're going to be naked. So uh, and you'll be exposed as uncircumcised. That uh, so the cup, the cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. This is God's wrath upon the Chaldeans. This is going to come to pass. He said in verse 17, For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you and the plunder of beasts, which made them afraid. And, and just keep in mind that whenever these uh, conquering nations pass through a land, 
there's more than just the uh, people that suffer. You know, the ecology of the land suffers, the uh, beasts of the land, they suffer. It's uh, kind of like they cut a swath through the territory and everything dies. It says, uh, because of it going, going on in 17, because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and all of who dwell in it, that's the reason for it. this is going to, to happen. Now, what profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, Awake, to silent stone, arise, and it shall teach. And behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver. In it, and in it, there is no breath at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the, all the earth keep silence before him. That uh, will appear a number of different times um, somewhere. I had uh, wanted to read you a portion of uh, Isaiah, which talks about this very thing, uh, verses 18 and 19. And it really emphasizes the um, idea of, of graven images. It says in Isaiah the 44th chapter, verses 9 through 21, those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. They can't feel shame at all. They're you know, they're just things. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Men are making gods. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with the tongs works one in the cold, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water, and is faint. He's talking about the, the blacksmith. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass, and he makes it like a figure of a man. According to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself. He takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes a carved in it, makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They do not know nor understand, for he has shut their eyes so they, they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on his coals, have roasted meat and eaten it, and I shall, shall make the rest of it an abomination, an idol. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes, a deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? So it really uh, speaks to the uh, uh, rationality of the people that worship idols. They know these things are uh, made by them. They know the things are not alive. 
yet they treat them as if they are gods and worship them. You know, that is the height of idiocy, really. Uh, to, to, as I say, would say, take half a log, make uh, use half of it to uh, burn in the fireplace, and the other half to fashion to an idol and then worship it. They all know it comes from the same place. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Um, now, where is His holy temple? Where is His holy temple now? <laughs> it's always been in heaven. Heaven is where He is. The uh, If you want to speak of an earthly temple here akin to the temple in uh, Jerusalem there's the church but God is in heaven and it says let all the earth keep silence before him that's kind of uh, like saying uh, uh, won't you just uh, keep quiet and listen God is in control he has the power uh, just Keep quiet. Let him do his thing. And recognize he has power over all these things. In chapter 3, a prayer of uh, Habakkuk, the prophet, on, if you want to pronounce that, you're welcome to try it. <laughs> but anyway, this uh, what follows is what's called a dithyram. Uh, that's just a uh, term that is a it's kind of a, not exactly a poem, but it's something that has a lot of emotion attached to it. Uh, and it may seem kind of wild at times. We may not get that in the English, but if you go back to Hebrew, it would appear that way. So uh, uh, Habakkuk understands now what's going on, and he uh, offers this prayer uh, to God. He said, Oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. He has a proper fear, fear God and keep His commandments, that sort of deal. He has a proper uh, fear. He said, O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. That, in the midst of the years means right now, during the present time. In the midst of the years, uh, make it known. In wrath, uh, remember mercy. Now, if we recall the history of the people before this time, up to this time, uh, in those times that God exercised His wrath, He also exercised His mercy. So he, He's saying, there's wrath to come. I know, I know there's wrath to come, but uh, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. And that just means that God is... Uh, He's everywhere and He's over everything. His glory covered the... Uh, and this, this is what's called a theophany, which is giving uh, human characteristics to God. It, uh, it's descri describing God in ways we can understand. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of His uh, praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there, in those things are just mentioned, there his power was hidden. There was so much brilliant and uh, splendor that it uh, kind of hid his power, but his power was there. So we see in verse 5, before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. He can use these things. God can use these things to uh, uh, to show His wrath, and He did in the past. He's used them before, and if necessary, He'll use them again. He stood and measured the earth, which is no problem for God to measure the earth. He looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered, and the perpetual hills bowed. And when you hear uh, mountains and hills, that's something that is uh, considered everlasting because they've always been there. 
but he has power over those also. His ways are everlasting. They were there in the beginning, they were there then, and they're there, they're here now. And his ways are blessing where when there's obedience and punishment when there's not. I saw the tents of Cushion and affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian. Cushion or Cush is uh, Ethiopia, and uh, Midian was kind of to the east of the uh, Aqaba, the uh, the lower end of Dead Sea in that direction. So it's it's covering all that area, and. Uh, so he's in control of all those areas. He said, Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you were... And keep in mind that he used these things to punish his people or the nations. Like, just remember the Red Sea that parted and the Egyptians were drowned in it? Or were the, the Red Sea or the rivers, were they all matted? Uh, God, no. It's just something that he used. It was there and he used it uh, for his purposes. Those are his instruments of wrath and punishment. And he says that you rode on your horses. Uh, of course, horses always. Remember, horses are symbols of military power or power. Your chariots of salvation. So the this military horses are put in chariots and it's all for the purpose of salvation all these things that he's doing uh, using you know, the rivers and the seas and and why they have you to punish people it's all for the purpose of salvation he wants people to be saved it says in verse 9 your bow was uh, made quite ready you know that these uh, uh, the bowmen would uh, carry their bow slung over their shoulders or somehow now they, they wouldn't march at the ready. But it says here, they're ready. They're in position. So oaths were sworn over your arrows. And I'm sure they were. But he said, you divided the earth with the rivers. They're all part of his creation. The mountains saw you and trembled the overflowing of the water passed by the deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high the sun and moon stood still in their habitation you remember Joshua when he was uh, needed a little more time to complete his uh, victory God made the sun and moon stand still at the light of your arrows they went, and the shining of your glittering spear. Now all this says that all these things, all the natural world, obeys God. So if He used these things, even in a providential way, to uh, exercise His control or His will, He actually controls and wills that they'll be used. And it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, miraculous many times it was in the past but it doesn't necessarily have to be he can use these things providentially and a lot of times it was used providentially when the people were disobedient so that drought was brought upon them and this that and the other and, and uh, most of the time they didn't catch on but anyway Verse 12, you marched through the land in indignation. God marched through the land in indignation. And he'd do it again. He would do it again. You trample the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people. Again, his purpose in all this was the salvation of his people. He doesn't do that just because he likes to see people suffer. He doesn't like people to be hurt. He wants them to be saved. But his nature is that his justice will always prevail. 
if someone uh, sins and they are unrepentant, they must be punished. Verse 13, you went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation with your anointed. And that may be referring to the Messiah. Uh, you struck the head from the house of the wicked. Again, it, talking about the uh, Chaldeans and maybe speaking really about the king of the Chaldeans. You struck the head from the house of the wicked and laying bare from the foundation to the neck. Well, that about includes all of the uh, body, of, if it's the king, the body of the king. Got his head taken care of and from the feet to the neck, which is the rest of the body. So it's all uh, struck down. He thrust through with his own arrows. And if you look at the history of these uh, nations, uh, you know, Stalin was a very suspicious person. You know, if he even thought that uh, he didn't like what you said or didn't like something you did, even though it was really nothing to it, he'd just have you killed. So these rulers back in this time are always suspicious. And they had a right to be because their uh, uh, power was very tenuous and there's always someone trying to usurp it. So it's uh, very proper to, for, for this to say he thrust through with his own heirs. He used the heirs of the kings, let's say the king's opponents, to thrust him through the head of his villages. Uh, they came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. That's the, talking about the righteous. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. And these nations did, in fact, feed on the poor, took whatever they had. It says, verse 15, you walk through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. You might, if you want to think of a heap of the great waters, think of the Red Sea. When I heard, verse 16, when I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself. When he came to the realization that God had all this power and would use it, but it was for his salvation that caused him to uh, tremble. And I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. Well, there's a day of trouble that's going to come. But because of his knowledge now, his understanding of what God is, is all about, he can rest in that day of trouble. He, he can be uh, have the peace that passes understanding. He can have that. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Uh, though the fig tree may not blossom. Now, now, in this particular deal, he's going to talk about all the things that are important to the people of Judah, to anybody in that area. Though the fig tree may not blossom, figs are very important nor fruit on, uh, be on the vines. Though the labor of the olive may fail, the olive trees are very important to the economy there. And the fields yield no food. There's not going to be any grain, even though you don't have any grain. Though the flocks be cut off from the fold, uh, sheep and whatever they raise for, as livestock, even if that's cut off, and there will be no herd in the stalls. Even so, back says, because now he understands, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And it brings, brings to mind that the just or the righteous, if you want to use that, the just shall live by faith. The Lord God is my strength. Through all these things, he will rely on his God. He will make my feet like deer's feet and make me walk on my high heels. 
And I guess it's uh, like most times, if you're on a, if you occupy the high ground, you have an advantage over those that don't. So he's going to make these his people walk on the high ground. So that's Habakkuk. The next one is, uh, yes, sir. New King James, yeah. Sela, yeah, and, and that I didn't mention that because uh, it's it's probably if this was set to music or something like that, that's that's some sort of control or. They're not real sure what it is, yeah. But the point I wanted to make is if, if it is like that, a pair of a backup, and then you know she closes out with um, uh, to the chief singer. Chief musician, yeah. Uh, that tends to say this was designed for them to sing to honor God for his power and his protection over all their enemies. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, that's why they call it a dithyram, because that's, uh, that was intended to be very, if you want to call it, uh, lyrical, um, very uh, kind of poetic. And it's kind of like a psalm. It's kind of like a psalm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, what, that's what this is. Yeah, <clears throat> and it was not four-part harmony. <laughs> yeah, so it, it makes you wonder what it was a string in, instrument. What was a string instrument? What kind of tune was it playing? We don't know. It's more. I would say it's more like a Gregorian chant. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be? But they didn't. Well, the I don't know about that. Since these were uh, Jewish people, they. I don't know. It, it, it's uh, yeah, a lot good, so good. Yeah. But uh, as to everybody had the way writing materials were then, not after everybody had something in their hand. Yeah. Now that's where if you look at the old work, the worship goes on right now in the, in the temples. That's why you have the temple. Yeah. Who was the one playing the organ and, uh, and uh, playing the drums? <laughs> yeah, you'll have to find anything. I can. Uh, you ever been to uh, certain funerals <laughs> where they're playing musical instruments and singing at the same time? Talking about a headache, you get a headache in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Can't hear the words, but man, <clears throat> instrument's pretty good. Well, I just want to emphasize this is just one of the places like the song. Well, yeah. Well, a lot of the. 
when the Psalms are written, or this is written like a song. And uh, I, I, not all Psalms are dithyrams, but uh, this one certainly is. A dithyram is like a psalm, but uh, say a dithyram is more um, in an excited state, if you will, very uh, emotional and and very forceful. But it's still it's still a song. And there's probably some songs like that. But anyway. Haggai is the is the next uh, book, and whereas uh, Habakkuk, its theme was um, Habakkuk questioning why God would use such an evil nation to punish quote-unquote, a, a righteous nation. Judah wasn't righteous, but there were some that were. And, it, and of course, the righteous were going to have to suffer along with the, the unrighteous. But once he understood that, then, then he was okay with it. But uh, uh, Haggai had one message. Build the temple. And if you recall, um, oh, a few a couple of months ago, something like that, I had a, a uh, Wednesday night deal on the, the uh, small things that had to do with uh, building the temple. And really, to as a background to Haggai, you'd really need to. Uh, read Ezra, maybe some of Nehemiah, but Ezra and uh, Zechariah, and I say, say some of uh, Nehemiah. Those things have to do with, at least in part, with uh, rebuilding the temple or the wall, as the case may be. So I thought it might be useful <clears throat> in the little time that we have left for me to read what I had written back then about. Uh, what was uh, done about the wall and temple. What I written then, I said, uh, I said there was a buzzer, gives me five minutes. Nehemiah was permitted by King Artaxerxes to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and that's recorded in Nehemiah, the second chapter, verses 11 through 16. And, uh, of course, Nehemiah uh, was going to view the walls, but he didn't tell anybody about his plans. So in that uh, Nehemiah, the second chapter, verse 11 through 16, he, he said, So I came to Jerusalem, and we was there three days. Remember, it, uh, Jerusalem has been, been in a uh, uh, state of destruction for 70 years, about 70 years. Then I rose in the night, and, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. I went out by night to the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. And I went to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So it's a, a serious state of uh, uh, destruction. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the official did not know where I had gone or what I had done. And I had not told, yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then in the uh, same chapter, verse 17, then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are, are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. 
and they set their hands to this good work. And so he says in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, what the people had a mind uh, to work. And it says joined together. You mean the wall was complete? It may not have been uh, completely as tall as it needed to be, but it uh, was joined together. In the book of Ezra, we read that the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, the temple and the wall are different. It began under Zerubbabel, however, because of opposition. They were forced to stop building the uh, temple. And it uh, ceased for about 16 years. And it didn't resume until the uh, reign of uh, Darius. And there was some question about whether uh, this was authorized. And it was authorized by Cyrus to build the temple, but there was some question about it. I guess they couldn't find the record of it. But now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. That's when they had to quit work. And the work of the house of uh, God that was is at Jerusalem ceased. And it was discontinued until the second year of King of Darius, Darius king of uh, Persia. In Haggai, the, uh, we'll get to this, but Haggai, the first chapter, verse 1 and 2, in the second year of King Darius, or Darius, in the sixth month, First day of the month, this is sixteenth, second, this his second year. This he came to the throne in 522 B.C. and so that meant that the temple started to be rebuilt in 520 B.C. Uh, where the Lord came by Haggai, prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. I pray, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This prophet, uh, people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And we'll read on later in, in Haggai. Uh, and the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses, go up the mountains, bring wood, and so forth? And uh, I'm not going to be able to get through all this. In Ezra, the fifth chapter, verses 1 and 2, you'll have to wait until next week to find out what that says. I'm going to put a star by here, too, so I know 